So let's, uh, let's introduce the financial intermediary now so we can see where some leakage in the system occurs. And um, we, our situation that we've set up is Microsoft has an external debt that it pays at LIBOR plus 10 and would rather have a fixed rate. Uh, Intel has a, an external debt at 5.2% but would rather pay LIBOR. So Intel is going to enter into an agreement with the financial institution. The financial institution will enter into an agreement with Intel. Microsoft will do the same thing, enter into an agreement with the financial institution. And financial institution will enter into an agreement with Microsoft. So Microsoft and Intel may not even know that the other exists. They, they won't know who's on the other side. The financial institution has sort of set the whole thing up for them. And Intel, we, we know, is going to pay LIBOR. So we will pay LIBOR to the financial institution, and it will pass LIBOR along to Microsoft. Microsoft has agreed in exchange to pay 5% uh, on, the, on the original loan, but there's a financial institution in here, so it's not going to be 5%. Microsoft doesn't know it could have been 5%, but it's going to be the 5% plus whatever fee the, uh, the institution wants, which is typically uh, 15 basis points or 0.15%. So Microsoft will pay the 5 plus 0.15. Now, this will be netted out. Whatever the net amount is will either go to the financial institution or head over to Microsoft. But notice that the 0.15 is in there. That will stay with the financial institution. On this side, the financial institution will forward on to Intel that 5% minus 0.15%. Because remember now, we're talking about two separate contracts. The financial institution is sitting on this side of the swap with Microsoft. So there's the commission for that. And the financial institution is sitting on this side of the swap with Intel. So there's the commission on that. So Intel and Microsoft could have dealt with each other and eliminated the middleman and saved the commission on both sides, but they don't know that. And the idea that this could perfectly line up is, again, just a contrived example to show you what a swap is. In the real world, you need this person in the middle. My motivation here is just to show you that you've got to include this cost in with this. So now this, again, would also be netted out. So the financial institution is making that spread. Notice now that the swap rate is 5% from the financial institution's perspective. However, from Microsoft's perspective, it is 5.015. From Intel's perspective, is 4.985. So we can think of that as the bid-ask spread that the financial institution is willing to post to enter into a fixed for floating agreement. I'm going to expand on that later, and if you've already read ahead in the chapter, you'll see that, oh, yeah, yeah, we got to get to that. So what does Intel do? Well, Intel pays. Let's see what Intel pays. Intel is going to pay 5.2% externally, pays 5.2, plus it's going to pay LIBOR to the financial institution. So there's what it pays. Intel gets, on the other hand, 4.85%. So that, once you figure out what it pays and what it gets, it nets out to LIBOR because it gets LIBOR, or sorry, it pays LIBOR, plus the difference between 5.2 and 4.985. If we head to the other side and look at Microsoft, Microsoft pays LIBOR plus 10 externally. It still has to pay this, LIBOR plus 0.1% externally. And it pays 5.15% as a party to the swap. So that it will pay LIBOR plus, and it gets LIBOR. So that when we net out what they receive, Microsoft, or sorry, what they pay, we can see that the total has now increased by 30 basis points. 15 basis points on this swap. 15 basis points on this swap. The total aggregate interest expense is now 30 basis points higher than what it would have been had there been no swap and Microsoft just did its thing and Intel just did its thing. So as of right now, it looks like this is an inefficient market in the sense that all it does is it actually just raises costs 
across the board. Uh, and the financial institution is just extracting more money in aggregate from the entire system. That can't hold if that were, if that were the case. That wouldn't hold. So we need to find another reason why, uh, and we will. So to um, keep in mind what, what's happened so far, in our original situation, we had LIBOR plus 5.3 percent in aggregate. That was the aggregate expense that was paid between the two companies. In our new situation, we now have LIBOR plus 5 point, which is 30 basis points higher. So if we're going to save the swaps market here, we need to find a better reason than intermediation. Intermediation means that two companies uh, aren't going to find each other and the financial institution just acts as an intermediary between them. We need to find a more uh, a compelling argument for the existence of the swap market. So before we move on here, now that we've introduced the financial institution, let's talk about market makers. Because in this example, I said the financial institution will enter into one swap agreement with Microsoft and will then enter into another swap agreement with Intel and Microsoft and Intel may not even know that the other is even doing business with this financial institution, let alone really being the offsetting trade on these two swaps. So the financial institution must be prepared to act as a market maker. Well, let's think about what, what this swap would actually look like. Uh, if, we, if we set up a trade in the marketplace, what would that swap look like? Well, we could sell a fixed rate bond and we would owe a fixed rate of interest. If we sell a fixed rate bond, we owe a fixed rate of interest. We can then use the proceeds of that bond to buy a floating rate bond, thereby receiving a floating rate of interest. That's basically a swap. We're going to sell the fixed rate, use the proceeds to buy the floating rate. As we receive floating rate interest, we pay the fixed rate interest and hope we make money, right? Well, there's a bit of a problem in that. These are, if these are tradable bonds, you need to sell a fixed rate bond at the same price that you would buy a floating rate bond. You need to sell them at the same price. So it appears then that a swap rate is a fixed rate that a market maker would be willing to pay or willing to receive in exchange for LIBOR. On day one, the floating rate bond, the value of the floating rate bond will be par. Now remember what I said, on day one, it is known with certainty what LIBOR is, it is known with certainty what that first interest rate payment will be. So if you're discounting a coupon rate by the same rate as the coupon rate, if the discount rate and the coupon rate are the same, what do you end up with? You end up with a par bond. On day one, swaps are set up so that they are worth zero. That's, that's point number one we're going to get to here. All swaps are worth zero on day one. So if the floating rate bond has a value of par and all swaps are worth zero on day one, we need a fixed rate of interest such that the value of the fixed bond is equal to the value of the floating bond so that you're worth zero. That's what the financial institution does. It posts a set of rates, a bid and ask rate on the, uh, for, and, and the middle point, the average is typically called the swap rate, at which they are willing to trade for LIBOR. Let's get to that. Just a little bit of house cleaning before we move on. Let's get through this day count uh, convention uh, business first. I've already brought it up. Uh, LIBOR, being a uh, money market uh, interest rate, uh, is calculated on an actual 360-day convention. We've already covered that. The fixed rate uh, uh, amounts are typically uh, calculated as actual, actual, or 30, 360, and we've already covered that for longer term duration than money market. So what happens uh, when the, the interest rate is paid um, in the swap agreement that we talked about. Recall that on day zero, we observed a 4.2% interest rate, and we implied that the first interest payment from Intel to Microsoft would be 2.1 million. Well, that's not exactly correct, is it? 
This uh, observation uh, of this rate occurred, remember we entered into this on March 5th, 2012, so the next payment is September 5th, 2012. Well, there are 184 days between uh, that payment date, not exactly six months, so we can't just divide it in two. So it should have been, the interest should have been 100 million times the 4.2 times the 184 over 360 times the amount of time. So this is the notional amount times the total interest times the period of the year on which it's owed. We'll get 2.1467 million, not 2.1 million. All of these things matter. Time, value of money. You must be precise with the dollars. Uh, so that, uh, that is uh, the payment that it would be. Now, before I finish up with the day count convention, I'm going to run down here to confirmations. Uh, there are two types that you have to be aware of in a swaps agreement, the business day convention and the holiday calendar, holiday calendar being used. Uh, in this uh, example, we have Intel and we have Microsoft, two American companies, so may as well use the U.S. calendar, right? But this is the more important one, the business day convention. Uh, if the payment date is a weekend or holiday, what do you do? Uh, it might be following business day. It might be the previous business day. So you have to look at what the business day convention is. Now, if it's the following business day, if a fixed rate payment occurs on a Saturday, it might be the Friday or it might be the Monday, which means, uh, remember we said Microsoft knows with certainty that it will pay $2.5 million on each payment date for six months. Not if it's a Saturday. If they have to pay it on a Friday, it'll be somewhat lower. Uh, sorry, it'll be somewhat lower. If they have to pay it on a uh, Monday, it'll be somewhat higher. So it won't exactly be 2.5 million each time, much as this won't be evenly uh, 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 4.2, just cut in half. So we have to worry about the day count conventions. For the purposes of learning, for this chapter, for the purposes of learning, we're going to ignore that for now because it'll just make it easier to learn what the swap is, that's, that's the learning objective here, is, is to understand what's going on. Precision can happen later on. Once you understand what's going on, adding a little precision isn't that much more. So, if we are going to uh, turn LIBOR, uh, or convert LIBOR into a fixed rate, we could simply multiply this by whatever we get here, 365 over 360. And if we're going the other way from fixed to LIBOR, you can multiply this rate by... 360 over 365. Nice easy corrections depending on which way you want to take the rate.